and know everyone. So I don't normally do a prologue when I'm doing a book review, but I am doing a prologue for the handbook for mortals. And the reason that I am doing a prologue is the main character, Zaid, just comes across like, I'm just not like any other girl. No shit, you do magic. She doesn't say that. It's just everything is like, oh, I'm just different. I just don't do things the way other girls would. I wear a tankini while other people wear bikinis. It's just ridiculous stuff like that. And really, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a scene in the book where she was like, I need a hammer. Which shoe would best work? Is it going to be the more expensive one? I don't know, but green is my lucky color. Why don't I have a hammer? Because I'm just not like other girls. And it just is the overall tone of the book. It's everything. It just feels like everything in the book. And, oh, I'm ugly. I'm so much uglier than everyone else. I don't know why anyone finds me attractive. And it doesn't say that she does anything weird with her makeup. It's not like she's saying, oh no, I can't find something to do my eyebrows. Quick, I have pens because I paint on rocks. So I'm just going to shake this bad boy up and we'll just uh, start doing the liners there because, you know, I'm just not like everyone else. I'm so quirky and that's what quirky girls do. Honestly, I'm almost all the way through the book and I'm actually surprised she hasn't said something like, I don't use a plushy cat fur purse like those other girls. I just re use a real cat and I just pull the money off when I need it. And when I get the change, I just stick it right up here. And when I need some, I just squeeze them in the stomach and it falls out on the counter because I'm quirky and not like other girls. And honestly, the worst sin of all, in my opinion, is she has multicolored hair and she talks about it like it's this huge thing. I had to go in and double check when this book was written. Pretty sure it's 2017 and wasn't written in the 1950s. So, you know, people aren't freaking out because people have multicolored hair. That's more or less a staple of our society now. But it's just one of the other things that makes her a little bit quirky and not like the other girls. And she's just, you know, so odd that she just can't be pretty. So I just had to get that out of the way. I don't even know why I started reading this book. Maybe it's because somewhere secretly I want to become an alcoholic and this might actually push me towards that. I'm not sure. But anyway, this is not the actual review. This is just the part where I complain about what a Mary Sue, the main character is, and how she's so quirky and not like other girls. And uh, I will see you in the actual book review soon. Hello, everyone. I am here today to talk about the Handbook, The Handmaid's Tale, The Handmaid for... Hold on. What is this damn thing called? Oh, yes. The Handbook for Mortals. And I will pop up the book on the screen in case you should decide to order it. So I think I'm going to do a new thing where if I do blow by blow of the book, I'm going to title it synopsis instead of book review. And then the ones where I don't want to do spoiler alerts or you, I really think it's a book that you should read and um, I don't want to ruin that for you, I'll keep those under the title book review. So this is where you're going to see my new title of synopsis. So here we go for the Handbook of Mortals. And I'm tired of being cold. I live in the Pacific Northwest. And you know what? If I want to do my book reviews wearing a bear zippy with little ears, I will because I am not like other booktubers. So there. So the story opens with Zaid of the multicolor hair deciding that today is the day she's going to leave town. Her mother reads tarot cards in Centertown, which used to be the capital of Tennessee. Wikipedia had something to say about that. That was the capital for like a day. 
Andrew Jackson changed it to Nashville. And according to Wikipedia, there were another few names that were also the town name for a short period of time, including Kingston, Knoxville, Murfreesboro, and Charlotte. So there, there we have it. Her mother confronts her as she is packing her car. Zaid wants to go to work for a show. But her mom already knows. That's why she's out at the car. She must have read her tarot cards and knows that Zaid is packing up to leave. And tries to warn Zaid, but Zaid wants a normal life. And my question for that is she joining the circus? Is she going to be working the pole at a strip club? What kind of show is she going to work for? Inquiring minds want to know. If it is a strip club, as her mother, yes, I would be concerned and warning her not to go. So she gets in her car and we get some Dixie Chick lyrics before finding out that she is heading to Las Vegas. Zaid enters a purple carpeted casino, which could literally be any of them, so I'm not sure which one she went to, and apparently everyone is already expecting her. Zaid, who pronounces her name as in Aid, with a Z, Zaid, meets the show blacks, which is apparently lingo for stage crew who wear all black to fade into the background, as the performers all wear some form of color. Maybe it's just me, but I feel like using the term stagehands would get the same concept across. I'm not even into political correctness on this one. It's just for me, it's about what your average audience member would understand. And I feel like people understand stagehands versus show blacks, but could again, could just be me. So Zaid is immediately struck by Mac, who isn't traditionally handsome, but rather striking when Charles walks in. This would be Charles Spellman, an older version of Harrison Ford, just a snappier dresser and the star of the show. Las Vegas convinced him to have a show on the Strip, and the rest is history because Charles's show is the best in the business. Except we don't say that around David Copperfield. Charles invited Zaid for an interview, and at their meeting, he also introduces Sophia Austin, another lead performer. You know their relationship must be secure because Sophia also lets Zaid know that she is Charles's girlfriend. Fortunately, Zaid ignores Sophia, God knows I wouldn't want any part of that, and continues ogling Mac, who is the technical manager. She also meets Zeb Zagan, who is less than thrilled to have her there. Zeb is the head illusionist. Very little is known about him in the magic community. I mean, that's totally not suspicious, right? And doesn't his name match someone else's? I even think I have a ticket of where I went. I gotta find that. We're gonna check that name out. Sounds a little too familiar. So right on the start, Zeb hates Zaid. Before performing, Zaid meets Trig, the stage manager who seems to like her. I mean, there's a photo on the cover that shows she has boobs, and that's enough for most people. When she hears Mac asking Charles if he is going to allow her to perform, Charles basically says she signed a waiver so I can't be sued if something happens and she falls to her death or death, death, whatever. She signed a contract. We're good. Zeb tells Mac to quit wasting his energy. Another man, too cute to date, named Cam, takes Zaid out to the rigging. Zaid has to climb a low catwalk 40 or 50 feet above ground. Cam hands her the rose she requested and she immediately throws it off the catwalk where it goes down to the stage and the impact causes the petals to scatter, showing that the stage is solid. So Zaid jumps and sparks start shooting out of her fingers and hit the ground, turning into a fire and changing from red to blue. Zaid splashes through the fire pool and dives into a true stunt pool, which is underneath the stage. Huh. The stage also becomes solid again. 
Now, this seems like a pretty cool trick, but how did the girl who grew up reading tarot cards learn how to do this? So after everyone is congratulating Zaid, she is thinking about how hard it's going to be to keep her secret because reading tarot cards isn't the only trick she knows. So why did she move to Vegas to perform in a magic show if she wants to keep her abilities secret? Yeah, you hear that silence? That's what the book has to say about that as well. I can see moving to Vegas actually to count cards like in Rain Man or even use your psychic abilities to know which machine is going to hit next and make a bunch of money. But um, if she wants to keep on the down low, I don't know why she's shooting sparks out of anywhere on her body and then jumping into fire pools. That just uh, doesn't work for me. But that doesn't matter because Mac is mad at her and her weird trick. Then he storms off. That's it. He's just mad, gets angry, storms off the set, doesn't like her trick. Zade is offered a contract and makes a vague remark about having lawyers looking at the contract for her. Apparently, besides magic, she also has a team of lawyers. I mean, this is one pretty happening young lady here. So Zade goes to sit in the theater and wait for her paperwork. Cam comes to find her. Apparently, Cam has really white teeth, so he's likable. They are chatting when Mac walks up. Mac angrily asks if he's interrupting something, and Zade says, only kindness. Mac looks confused. I'm confused. Um, was that supposed to be a witty response? That's not funny. Did anyone tell the author that that wasn't funny when they were editing the book? No, because it made it in. I just, I can't. We got to move on. Mac asks how the trick was done. Zade refuses to tell him. Mac is the technical manager and needs the information for OSHA compliance. Zade refuses and tries to flail out of the theater. But Charles, who runs the show, decides it's only necessary to tell him, and that's it. As long as he knows how the trick is done, it's fine. Because, you know, OSHA is a formality and doesn't care about worker safety. So Charles has got this. OSHA, to be worried about people jumping into fire holes, opening up in the middle of the stage and landing in water. Charles is on this one. So just, just go write more manuals about hazardous waste. A week later, Zeta's is at the casino where the show is, obviously and is getting fitted for her costumes. Mac walks by the door and just stares at her in her underwear like a creepy McCreeperson until his friend notices and he stomps off. He should be embarrassed. Incels are a thing, and it's not something anyone should aspire to. So Zay, I am going to have so much trouble with this girl's name. I do not know why. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I think it's a stupid name, but I'm going to have to work on that and get over that. So excuse me. Zaid leaves her fitting and bumps into someone definitely her type. His name is Jackson, and he must be a good guy because he has sparkling white teeth and sparkling eyes. Fortunately, Jackson has good reflexes and catches Zaid when she bumps into him. And then she also notices his dimples and chestnut hair. And, wait for it, he has a guitar strapped around his torso. Oh, 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 oh my, this Jackson guy. Woo! Jackson is the band leader and singer and guitar player for the house band. But Zayd is just like, yeah, I play a guitar too. So he tells her that it's hot. I mean, is it? My cousin can play a guitar and says he's in a band, but he actually just sits in his room and he plays the same three chords over and over again. So he's like, hey, hey, come listen to this. And I'm like, oh, okay, you got a new song? And he's like, yeah, I fall for it every time. So I go and then he just goes twang, twang, twang. And then I have to listen to that for about 30 minutes until I just start having evil thoughts about lighting his guitar on fire. But anyway, that's not the point. Jackson tells Zaid that he has a spare acoustic guitar in his dressing room and he would love to get in her pants. I mean, he would love to jam together. He would love to jam together sometime. <laughs> that's, 
jam together some time. Okay. Then Zaid is like, wait, why are you here? And Jackson tells her he has been assigned to take her on a tour of the casino. They're pretty standard. You have the cage, you have the ATMs, you have where all the machines are, where all the tables are. Sometimes they have a, you know, a giant stage or a little stage, depending on how big they are. But, you know, Jackson needs to take her on a tour. So now that she has a guided tour and all, Zaid decides that moving to Las Vegas was the best choice she ever made. You can get guided tours at a lot of places. Museums, lots of museums, different kinds of museums. You can get them from the grocery store, banks. Uh, so I don't understand why we're basing that I made this really great decision on a guided tour. But, you know, hey, that's her thing. So uh, best decision she's ever made. All right. A few days later, we find out that Zaid gets a premonition as well. She has one a few days later and tries to talk to Mac about it. Because Mac hates her for reasons, she tries to solve the problem herself, especially after Mac says premonitions are often unfounded because people listen to too much of their feelings instead of the facts. And this is the technical manager, ladies and gentlemen, responsible for everyone's safety. Then he has the nerve to get mad at her for keeping him from doing his job. What? That doesn't make any sense, but okay. Mac tells her to get into her spot for rehearsal when Zaid realizes that Riley and Sophia are arguing about her rigging for the rehearsal. Now, I have never been part of a circus act, but even I know the rigging and harnesses are for safety reasons. Sophia was actually arguing with that the harness was not comfortable. I mean, neither is death, so I'm not quite sure why Sophia thought that was a valiant argument. Rigging, death, death, rigging. Suddenly, the main platform starts moving and everyone panics because it's going too fast. Sophia falls off the platform and Zaid, while harnessed herself, knows she can't catch Sophia, so she swings herself into Sophia, changing Sophia's trajectory, and instead of Sophia hitting the stage, Zaid manages to knock her into the pool, the stage pool that's underneath everything. Zaid unhooks her harness and dives into the pool to save Sophia. Fortunately, Zaid used to be a lifeguard and starts doing chest compressions on Sophia. Instead of helping Zaid, Mac starts screaming about why Sophia wasn't wearing her harness. Riley told Mac he was telling Sophia to harness up when the platform started moving, which wasn't supposed to happen. A technical glitch. It's at this time I start thinking about how heartwarming it is that Sophia is literally hovering between life and death, and they all seem so concerned about her. Everyone starts comforting Mac about how it wasn't his fault when Sophia finally starts coughing up water and breathing. Gee, is this place hiring? I just, to have co-workers like that who care so much about you, I just would love to experience that once in my life. The paramedics cared more about Sophia than her teammates. Someone brings Zayd a towel and she dries off and she leaves to give Tad, who uh, I already have forgotten that he's a character, um, he must have yellow teeth or something, and Mac a chance to gossip about Zayd. Mac tells Tad that Zayd had a premonition something bad was going to happen. Tad tells Mac that he should listen if Zayd has premonitions and Mac flips out and admits that Zayd frustrates him. Mac then explains he doesn't date performers. Then he stomps off to have a cigarette. Zaid goes to the loading dock with Jackson's borrowed acoustic guitar. Mac actually tells Zaid that the song sounds like it's about him, but she told him she didn't write it. Then they talk about Magnolia, and apparently the song was in that. I think we missed a good opportunity to hear um, to say something about... Um, you're so vain. You probably think this song is about you. You're so vain. For a book that likes to make a lot of references to music, we missed that one. Just zoom. That would have been the perfect response. That's what I would have said. 
Mac then sort of apologizes for the way he handled her premonition. He tells her when people trying to help with his job, they mess it up worse. But he never gives an example of any time that that's happened where someone's tried to help him and then the building collapsed or uh, people just started spontaneously bursting into flames. And then he shares that he plays guitar too, watches movies, and rides his motorcycle on his days off. Uh Uh-oh, I'm sensing a love triangle. And I don't even feel like I know anything about either of the men, except for that Max sounds like he might be a budding psychopath. Um, So, uh, man, tough choice right now, this early in the book, but I'm going to go with Jackson. Because Jackson doesn't yell at you while you're literally giving CPR to people. That, that's, that's, that's who, Team Jackson, that's who I'm going for. So, the men in this book, we have Jackson, who seems happy-go-lucky, and Mac is dark and brooding. Hmm, this reminds me of something. I can't quite put my finger on it. I'm sure it'll come to me. Mac and Zaid start talking about motorcycles, and, you know, I'm going to be honest, my eyes glazed over at this point. I literally couldn't care. And... I ride motorcycles, and uh, it's been a while, but literally mm -mm, couldn't make myself come up with an ounce of any kind of interest in this conversation. He then asks her if her name is made up because, you know, that's not totally and completely rude. And she tells him it's short for, I'm going to get this wrong, Shez Hurazade. And he actually knows the story from 1001 Nights, or as Matt calls it, Arabian Nights. He then insults her parents by saying that's a heavy story for a small child, and his parents read him books like Green Eggs and Ham. Did you get your name from Green Eggs and Ham? Because why else would you even say that? She then asks what Mac stands for, and he said people started calling him MacGyver because he can fix anything. Did, did, they really, did, did they really? Or was it more of the case, you know, how someone starts a nickname for themselves, and then they tried to say, oh yeah, that's what Bob says, because I'm always so able to fix things. Just calls me MacGyver. I'm, uh, I'm, a little, I'm a little suspicious of that nickname. And his real name, and no, I am not making this up, is Clark Kent, because his dad likes Superman. Okay, I just need to take a little break there. And all I can think of is that I'm getting the real names of two of the main characters, and I don't care. Not even a little bit, because at page 95, I'm not even interested in who they are. So... I'm going to go eat some ice cream and see if the story gets better when I come back. I don't think the pistachio ice cream is going to help, so let's continue on. Tad calls Mac and tells him he figured out the glitch, so Mac leaves to go fix it. Before Mac leaves, he says Red Vines to Zade, his favorite Amy Mann song and candy. Is his birthday coming up or something? That just seems like such a strong hint. Is it going to be Christmas soon? I don't know. I don't don't just walk around telling people really specific things that I like, especially after I have treated them like crap the whole time. Zade takes us at a sign that they are becoming friends and starts playing Red Vines on the guitar she borrowed from Jackson. So, of course, Jackson walks up and he's like, Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. You're the best guitar player in the whole world or something. I'm not really sure what else was said. I'm just going to be honest. I wasn't paying attention. Jackson let Zade know Sophia is okay, but is somehow angry that Zade saved her life. I mean, she could rectify that, but murder is something frowned on no matter how worthy. It would probably make a better story too, but alas, Sophia just stays mad at Zade. So there we go. So then the cast and crew gather at McMullen's for Drew's birthday. Drew is the audio guy, in case you forgot. In a cringe-inducing scene, Sophia, Charlie's girlfriend, tries flirting with Mac all night. Mac tells Sophia that he's not interested, and people finally remember it's Drew's birthday. I mean, hello. 
and bring him out a chocolate cake. Really, that's five minutes of my life I wish I could have back. Or have a chocolate cake or something. I don't even know who Drew is. I, I actually think this is the first time Drew has been mentioned. But whatever, we're celebrating his birthday. Have some cake, Drew. Happy 20 to 40th birthday. All right, there we go. At some point after Drew's birthday, Zade is practicing diving from 60 feet in the air into a pool of water and Mac comes by to say hi, probably because she left him some red vines on his desk. And he says to her, you seem to like to swim and all, which I would have responded to with a blank stare or, hmm, water. Then I would have walked away because that's how I treat people who are really rude to me for no reason. But Mac then asks if she likes scuba diving because the cast goes camping on dark days. Just for the uninitiated, dark days are when there are no performances. You're welcome. 20 of my brain cells died screaming in agony just so I could bring that information to you. So let's take a moment of silence. I can still hear the screaming echoing in my brain. Zaid asks how deep the lake is, where they go camping, and Mac says 100 feet at least while adding that he is always willing to go deeper. Everyone gets shocked at the innuendo, and I'm starting to wonder if this book was ghostwritten by a group of 13-year-old boys. I mean, I can go deeper. Zaid said she's down to go the next time the crew goes camping. And wouldn't you know it. Zay joins the crew a few days later to go camping. Guess who doesn't do outside activities with their co-workers? This gal. I honestly would rather spend the weekend in jail learning how to make a shiv. Because to me, having to spend time outside of work with your co-workers, no matter how nice, wonderful, kind they are, is punishment. And if I'm going to go be forced to do something that I hate, I would rather learn a new skill, like making a shiv. Uh, I know someone who went to jail and they learned how to make dice out of a tube of toothpaste. I mean, I kind of feel like I'm missing out on some life knowledge here. So yeah, uh, no camping for me with the crew. Thank you. But anyway, Zaid goes swimming instead of setting her tent up like everyone else does. You sent the tent up first, but she's not like other girls. So she goes swimming first, and then she can't get her tent up. So after the tent collapses three times, she finally uses magic to set it up. That's magic with a K. Oh, car! Zay joins Jackson at the fire with Jeb, whose whole character arc is hating Zayd with this infernal burning rage. So he gets up and leaves. So Zayd is like, why does Zeb hate me? And, you know, Jackson's like, don't take it personally. He's not really friendly because so many people come and go. And each time they leave, it takes a part of his soul. No, that's actually not what Jackson said. I was just trying to make Zeb sound like less of a sociopath. But, you know, I tried. So then Zaid goes to talk to Mac when Riley asks to talk to him. Zaid is then accosted by Sophia and her BFF Mel. They tell Zaid not to get her hopes up to date Mac because he has a rule about not dating performers. I think we all know by now about this rule that Mac has about not dating performers. Zaid says she just wants to be friends with everyone. Apparently, both uh, Sophia and Mel tried and failed to date Mac. And Zaid says if she was trying, she could date him because she may not be as beautiful as Sophia and Mel, but she's more beautiful on the inside. And she'll play them the song sometime called Ugly Girl so they know what she's talking about. That's right. She may not be as good looking as all the other girls, but her soul is beautiful. Does this happen in real life? Do, do these conversations happen in real life? You know, I have had men make up rules like I don't date this type of person or I don't date that. I, I don't date people who wear glasses. It's something that, you know, they'll usually be like oddly specific. Like I don't date women who wear glasses and their name starts with L through Z. 
And I'm like, oh, great. I actually appreciate that. Thank you for letting me know that you're a commitment phobe. Awesome. And then they usually get pissed off and walk off. But no, truly, thank you for letting me know. I, don't be wasting. I don't want to be wasting my time flirting with someone who's going to be a giant baby man child the rest of their life. So uh, the point I'm making, though, is I have never had ridiculous conversations about dating or not dating someone at work. Number one, because I made the mistake of dating a coworker once, and when we broke up, I had a new job like a week later because I was not going to play that nonsense. I, it's a bad idea. We all have to learn that lesson the hard way, unfortunately, and I believe the term is, pardon my language, don't shit where you eat. And we've all got to go through it at least once to figure out why it's a bad idea. Two, shallow, pretty people don't care about your inner beauty. To them, you're still ugly. So it doesn't make sense to have conversation about how like your soul is beautiful. They literally don't care, you ugly troglodyte. That's what they're thinking in their head while you're trying to explain how your soul is sparkling and with unicorn glitter and all of that stuff. And three, it's actually really kind of crappy to tell your co-workers you will play them a song called Ugly Girl, even if they deserve it. Like, you have to work with these people. So I get it. I get the mean girl thing. But openly attacking other women you work with never ends well. Ever. I will say this. I have worked in a casino before. And one of my standard phrases is, People should have to compulsively enter the armed forces or work at a casino because while different, both are extremely rigid in their own ways. You will be trained by someone who completely demoralizes you. The civilians you encounter are completely non-compliant. You will work every holiday. Don't even ask about bereavement leave. Don't you dare or you will get put on punishment schedule. And there is a 50-50 chance you will leave with PTSD. But on the upside, you will leave and you will be uncertified as a psychologist, medic, troubleshooter, and fixer of all kinds of machines. People will call you names and tell you they hate you. And when your tour is up and you are free, you appreciate America in a way that you never did before. Trust me on this. But seriously, for real, you'll leave with PTSD. I would just like to stop here for a moment and say for all the active and retired military people who may watch this video, thank you for your service. Genuinely, thank you for fighting for our personal freedoms. As for any casino workers out in the audience, fight me because you know what I said is true. So to me, this conversation Zaid is having with Sophia and Mel is pointless, petty, and nobody wins. Y'all just come out looking like catty bitches. And is that what, how you want people to see you? No, which is why you don't have these conversations. Don't engage. Just let it go. Be, that's why they have sayings like, be the bigger person, because the, you never win. This is a situation you never win. So after that, we are back to rehearsals. Wasn't that a fun camping trip, everybody? Yay! We heard so much about s'mores, lighting fires, singing songs, all of that bonding stuff. Oh, wait, I did that thing again where that was a different book I read. So Zaid gets up the nerve to ask Riley, who does her rigging, about Max's no dating performers rule. And apparently Mac thought he was dating a performer, but they were just friends with benefits, if you know what I'm saying. And he fell in love with her. And she was like, dude, we're just shagging. You're like my flavor of the month. And you work at a casino. Like, girls got to aspire to something a little bit better. Know what I mean? So Mac doesn't date performers, period. And you know what? I don't think that's a bad rule. Again, don't date people you work with. 
But as we can tell, that's not where this, the tone is going in this. I, I, I can't even come up with an adjective for this book without swearing. So we're just going to say book. More rehearsals with nothing happening until one night when Zaid was about to clock out, Jackson came up behind her and asked if she was still coming to see his band play. The name of the band is The Plain White Tees. Then Jackson explains that they can't play their own music. They have to play what the casino wants. So I'm assuming a mishmash of hits from like the late 90s until now. Uh, unless it's, unless for in my experience, the casino has a big headliner coming in. Usually, you know, kind of after they're getting a little older and they're still, their career is still alive. But, you know, they do do tours like Cher, which... I love Cher, um, Celine Dion, things like that, where people start going on tours. One of my favorite shows that I ever went to see at a casino was um, Sheena Easton. Awesome. Sheena, I, I don't care how old you get, baby, you still got it. And you put on what the heck of a show. It was awesome. So, of course, they don't get to play what they want to do. They've got to play stuff probably like on the weekends for the people who want to come and dance and do other things other than gamble. So Mac and Tad are also walking to the parking garage when Zaid agrees to go to the show. Jackson kisses her, uh, jumps into his car and speeds out of the parking lot, apparently not caring if there was any little old ladies who were using walkers or anything. Just zoom, zoom, zoom. And he's off. Tad compliments Zaid on her crotch rocket and leaves. Don't any of you act surprised about the motorcycle. Zaid isn't like other girls. We have already established that. Also, don't ask me what happened to her car. Uh, because she came to Las Vegas in a car. And... I can't be bothered to go back through the book to find out if she sold it. It appeared out of nowhere. She magicked it into existence. Um, I'm actually just seriously considering making a whiskey sour to get through the rest of this review. So she has a crotch rocket now. After Jackson leaves, Mac asks Zaid if she wants to go for a motorcycle ride. Mac has a Triumph Dakota and Zaid has a Ducati. They have also taken to giving each other pet names. Mac calls Zaid Magi Girl and Zaid calls Mac Superman. I just can't. I just can't. At some point during the ride, they stop and Mac admits to liking Zaid. She reminds him of his rules. Zaid feels like she's pushed Mac into kissing her. Oh, I guess that after they stopped on the ride, he kissed her. Or was that something we assumed? Or did I have too much to drink? I don't know. He kissed her. We're just moving on with it. And Max says, no, I'm tired of fighting it. I have listened to Ario Speedwagon. Maybe I like trouble. Wh what am I reading here? Wh it's okay for you to kiss me because I listened to Ario Speedwagon? What? Who? Why? How? <sighs> Is saying I like Ario Speedwagon code for I'm on meth and will stick my dick in anything? I Is it? I don't. I, sometimes, you know, I'm not hep with what the kids are saying. So you got to help me out. Leave a message in the comments if, if, if that's what that meant. Or if it means Netflix and chill, whatever the sayings are. I just... I like Ario. I've been listening to Ario Speedwagon. So it's okay if you kiss me now. I just feel like a part of my soul is dying. Okay. I really feel like the author thinks she wrote all this witty banter for her characters. And I'm starting to feel like my book was supposed to come with some free LSD or something like that to make this understandable in some way. Because... I don't get it, and I'm halfway through the book. Like, I'm at the halfway point. I don't know what's going on. People say random things that you would never say in real life. And um, 
Where did the motorcycle come from? The next day, Zaid goes to the mall to find something to wear to Jackson's show. Because she's not like other girls, it took Zaid a long time to find something to fit her slender 5'9 frame. But don't you worry, she perseveres. Zaid even ran into Carrot Top and Wayne Newton, who were doing a charity event at the mall. I don't know if we're acting like that's a good thing or a bad thing. Wayne Newton, we're cool. I just... Carrot Top. Uh... Um... Zaid walks out to the parking lot and is accosted by some lady who just keeps saying, I know who you are. And talking about mortals are able to sense power, and that's why people like Zaid. She won't tell Zaid who she is, but takes the time to march about 30 feet in the opposite direction of this giant parking garage at the mall. Now, I would have grabbed my bags or maybe left them, ran to my car, screamed for help if others were outside, outside any, I don't know, uh, waved down mall security, but not Zaid. She just stands there waiting to see what this woman is going to do. And she watches while the woman gets to the other side of the parking garage and then does this push movement with her hands. And I would just like to say, I think that's stolen from Star Wars because they have that Star Wars Jedi push movement that's really freaking cool. And that would be the only power I would totally use all the time. In fact, I would abuse it until they took me away. I'm not even talking like I would push people over bridges or anything. I mean, I just push them into the water cooler and things like that. But anyway, so the lady uses her magic push movement and Zaid uh, slams, slams into the concrete side of the parking garage wall and she's stuck there. So then this other mystery lady tells Zaid to show her what she can do. Zaid is really confused. Uh, confused is not what I would be. I would be terrified. But uh, Zaid is really confused. But put her hands together. Starts, you know, like getting some little baby Yoda magic going. And sparks start flying from her hands. And she sends like some kind of spark ball across the parking lot and slams the mystery lady into the side of the parking garage where she was standing near. The mystery lady tells Zaid that she's amazing because she's able to do that and barely knows what she's doing. Then, out of nowhere, an orange Lamborghini pulls up. The lady jumps in before Zaid can ask any questions and just speeds off. Nothing unusual. I mean, I'm sure this kind of thing happens every Tuesday in Las Vegas. So Zaid just gets her stuff and goes home where she finally starts wondering who the lady is, how she knew her name, and how she knows that she practices magic. Magic with a K. Okay. Who is the mystery woman? Stay tuned for part two to find out because you know what? I got to get some more of this so I can finish the rest of this review. Maybe I need two bottles because the captain, the captain failed me on this one. So thank you all for watching this channel. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. If it's about any plot points from the book, I'll do my best to answer them, but this pains me to admit it. Like, I hope you can physically see that I'm in pain. Twilight was better than this. And on that note, I have to go. So I will see you in part two.